My name is Brandon, and welcome to the next video in my series on basic statistics. If you are new to the channel, welcome, and it's great to have you. If you are a returning viewer, it's great to have you back as well. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with classmates, colleagues, or friends, or anyone else you think might benefit from watching. So now that we're introduced, let's go ahead and get started. So this video is the next in our series on nonlinear regression. In previous videos, we talked about why a nonlinear model might be better than a linear one. We talked about the trade-offs a bit in those two options. In the previous video, we talked about general patterns in the quadratic model. Now in this one, we're gonna talk about the idea of overfitting. And the concept of overfitting, again, has a broad range of application. So not only in nonlinear regression, but also in other things in machine learning and things like that. But if you get this basic idea of what overfitting is, how it can be a trap that we fall into, you'll better understand those more advanced things. So let's go ahead and get started. So let's use a metaphor first. Let's say you go to a shop and there's a seamstress or a tailor and you have that person make a piece of clothing like a suit that perfectly contours and fits your body. So you walk out with a suit that just fits perfectly it's made just for you and it's wonderful. Well, let's say in a few years, you lose some weight or maybe you're not gr done growing yet or maybe you gain some weight or maybe you're tired of that suit and you give it to someone else. So what problem might you face in that? Well, if your body changes shape, your suit doesn't. So that perfectly fitted suit may no longer be any good. If you give that suit to someone else, the chances that their body is shaped exactly like your body is probably very small. All of us are shaped differently, different sizes, heights, weights, and so forth. So you have a suit that fits you at one point in your life perfectly. But when you go to apply it to a different point in your life or someone else, it may not fit. And that's a very good metaphor for overfitting. So we can create a model for our data that fits so well that when we throw new data at it, it falls apart. And that is the risk and the danger of overfitting. And this is a way to think about that as you progress through statistics. Think about it as a suit that you have made for you and just for you that may not be good for someone else or yourself at a different point in life. So here's the example we've been using. I'm not going to read through it. We have a car owner that keeps track of sales data. Um, for the salespeople and how many cars they sell over time based on the amount of weeks they have worked there. And the goal is to produce a model that minimizes error. And this is very important. Produce a model that minimizes error, but will also be good for new data that we throw at it. So here's our original data. Here's a scatter plot of that data. You can see how it looks. And we determined that a quadratic model or a second order polynomial actually worked best. So we took that weeks on the job variable or independent variable, we squared it, created a second variable based on the square of that. And this was our second order polynomial or our quadratic. So we go ahead and perform that analysis in Excel and we come out with some output. So our R squared, which was much higher than the linear model, our standard error was much lower than the linear model. The mean square error was about half of what it was in the linear model. And we can see that the p-value for both terms down here at the bottom are significant. So the weeks on the job and the square term are both significant. So we know they contribute to the overall model. And this is good. This is what we want. So we have higher variance explained, lower standard error. We have half the mean square error we had before. And both terms are significant. So this is, this is great. This is exactly what we want. So we can graph those in the same graph and see it obviously that the red dashed line, which is the quadratic model, fits the data better than the black dashed line, which is the linear model. So you can see that the R square value is much higher in the quadratic model, so, the, so more variance is explained. Again, this is exactly what we want. However, we begin to think, hmm, well, I did a squared term and that turned out well, so why not just go ahead and throw another term in there, throw the cube in there. So we're going to take the weeks on the job and we're going to cube it. So we take it to the third power. And this is what we have. So we have job tenure and weeks. Then we have the square term we had in the quadratic model. 
Now we throw in a third term, which is the cube of the job tenure in weeks. So now we have those three variables. So here is our third degree polynomial or our cubed version of this model. So our R squared is, you know, 90.9152. Our standard error is about 32. Those actually sound pretty similar to the quadratic or the second order polynomial. Our mean square is 1066, which seems about the same as the other one before. Look at our coefficients down here. We have P values that, I don't know, are starting to worry me. If you look down here, the original coefficient is now not significant. The squared term is not significant. The cubed term is not significant. And that should probably raise some suspicion in us when we're looking at this model. So here's the graph of that. So it looks fairly similar to the quadratic model. So we start, start in the lower left, it kind of goes up on a hill and goes down over to the right. It actually doesn't look all that much different on a graph. Okay, so that's our third degree polynomial. So now we start thinking, hmm, that worked out, I guess it looks pretty good and the terms are about the same. So what if we do another one? Let's throw in a weeks on the job to the fourth power in there. Okay, so now we take our job tenure, we have the square of it, we have the cube of it, and then we take it to the, to the fourth power. Now we have four variables in the model. Here's the output. We have an R square of 0.928. We have a centered error of 31.55. Our mean square is 99568. But look at our p-value for our terms down here. So the job tenure in weeks, the first one is 0.07. That's close, but not significant because clo close doesn't count in stats. It's either under 0.05 or not, and it's not, so it's not significant. Neither are the other three. So again, that should give us pause. And here's the graph of our fourth degree polynomial. So you can see that some weird things start to happen. Here in the lower left, it starts bending down towards the beginning. There's actually a slight dip here in the middle. It's, you can't perceive it very well, but it's actually there. And then of course it goes up and down um, to the right. So you see what's happening here? This line, the more terms we add, this line is starting to bend and contort to fit these individual particular values closer, to fit it better. So it's starting to bend and shift in certain places to fit. So now we're really going to go crazy. Well, that looked okay. Let's add another one. So now we'll take our job tenure to the fifth power. So we have our first four, and now we're going to take it to the fifth. So now we have all five variables in there. We do the fifth degree polynomial. R squared is still high, 0.9282. Standard error is 33.23. That's about the same it has been. The mean square is 1104. That's in the ballpark. And then the p-value though, look at everything down here. Nothing is significant anymore. Not even the intercept or nothing. It's all not statistically significant. And here's the graph. So now again, it starts to bend and shape and contort. It's not all that different than the fourth degree, but you can see it is starting to twist a little bit here, twist a little bit there, as it tries to follow the points exactly. So what we're seeing here in the graph is that it's trying to bend itself to literally follow each individual point in our data set. That's what it's trying to do. So what about the model comparison? We want to look at the values for the following, the multiple R, the R square, the adjusted R square, the standard error, and the mean square error. And we have some questions. How does each value change across all five models? What are we gaining, if anything, by adding higher order polynomials? And what is happening to the error across the models? Again, we wanna reduce error. So first, multiple R across models. So model one, we had a multiple R of 0.8955, and then it jumped up significantly for the quadratic or the second order polynomial to 0.95. That's a pretty big increase. Then for the third order, it, it went up a bit, but it was about the same as the second order polynomial. 
Here it went up a little bit more. And then it was about the same. You can see that the biggest jump was from the linear model, which is the first one, to the quadratic one, which is the second one. And then from there, it went up a little bit, but it was fairly consistent, 0 0.95, 0 0.95, 0 0.96, 0 0.96. Okay, just a little bit of variation as you go across. So what about the R squared? So we have 0 0.80, then a big jump when we go to the quadratic, and then 0 0.91, 0 0.92, 0.92. So that there's a slight increase as you progress. But again, the biggest jump was from the linear model to the quadratic model. And then from there, it kind of went up incrementally. And actually, there's actually something very important there, but I'll get to it um, in time. What about the adjusted R square? So again, same pattern. The biggest jump was from the linear to the quadratic. Then we have a little bit of fluctuation from there. What about the standard error? So here, we went from 45.94 down to 32.67. That's exactly what we want. So remember, the standard error is a measure of how well the data points fit around the regression line, whether it's linear or curved, and a decrease is a good thing. That means the data fits around the line better. So here we went 32, 31.5, 33. Again, the same pattern. After you go to the quadratic, it pretty much stays the same across. What about uh, mean square error, MSE? Again, a measure of our model error. So 2110, then it goes down by almost half to 1067 in the quadratic, and then it's about the same. A Little bit of dip there in the fourth order quadratic, but it's about the same. So what about model comparison here? And here they are back to back. So you can see across all of these, that it would appear that we got the biggest bang for our buck in the quadratic one, which is the second model there. From that, pretty much everything stays the same. Now, overfitting. So as is apparent, by introducing more complexity into our model, we're not getting much more out of it. It is a case of diminishing returns. So we can keep throwing in higher and higher order polynomials but we're not getting more out of it by doing that. All we're doing is overcomplicating the model. The model begins to follow the points in the data exactly. So the more terms we throw at it, the curve or the line starts to bend and shift and contort to follow each data point individually. So there we start modeling the natural variation in the data. It actually starts following the individual points so we start to have a, back to our original metaphor, a tailored suit problem that will not fit someone else. So we're creating a model that fits exactly, or it's working towards fitting the data exactly, which will not work for something else. So new data may not fit the model because the model is too specific. It's too tailored to this sample. And then of course the machine learning applications when we validate this model, you know, hey, it's, it, you know, it fits, it really, really fits tight. Then we throw some new data at it and the errors are all over the place because we've overfit the model. And that's a huge problem. So it's always about a balance, right? You're trying to find that sweet spot. So new data may not fit this model if we overfit it. So again, when we throw new data at the model, the error may be high. So how do we choose a model? When we look at this, we can see that the second order, the quadratic model, seems to where we get the most value out of adding that extra term. Everything beyond that is just overcomplicating the model, weird things start happening in there, and we should just stop. So by looking at these higher order models, we know that, you know what, we're not getting more out of it the more terms we throw in, so our quadratic model is probably the best. So one thing about our metaphor that it could be good is that if your tailored suit no longer fits you because you've lost some weight and gotten a bit healthier, that's a good thing. So feel free to hand that tailored suit off to someone else who may get some good use out of it. So that wraps up our next video in nonlinear regression about a very important topic, the basics of overfitting. So again, we talked about how making a model more complex doesn't mean we get anything more out of it. And in fact, 
we can have a problem where throwing new data at an overly tailored or overly fitted model can create problems for new data we introduce into it. Now we did not do that in this video because again, this was just sort of the beginning of the concept of overfitting, but we will get there. We're working slowly towards this idea of throwing new data at a model to see the balance between fitting and sort of being generalizable. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching. Keep on learning. I look forward to seeing you again in the next one. Take care.